So good afternoon. I'm Michael Atkinson. It's really my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Josh Royce, who is one of the bright young stars in our division of hematology oncology. Dr. Royce uh, earned his bachelor's degree in biology at Brandeis University, his MD from the University of Rochester, and then completed internal medicine training at UVA and did an oncology fellowship at Johns Hopkins before joining our division of hematology oncology in 2020. He specializes in the treatment of patients with uh, thoracic malignancies, particularly lung cancer, mesothelioma, and thymoma. And today he's going to speak on advances in immunotherapy and resectable non-small cell lung cancer, so neoadjuvant immunotherapy efforts. Uh, and he's gonna update us on those novel approaches and also on toxicity monitoring. So Josh, take it away. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Dr. Atkins. I'm excited to be here and talk about one of my passions. Uh, which is perioperative immunotherapy and lung cancer. So again, I, I thank you again, Dr. Atkins, for that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Voting on this. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, warm uh, introduction. Uh, so again, my name is Joshua Royce. I'm an assistant professor of medicine and thoracic medical oncologist at Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Center and MedStar Georgetown Hospital. And I'm very excited and honored to be talking to you all about advances in immunotherapy and resectable non-small cell lung cancer. These are my disclosures. This is the outline that my talk will follow. I'm going to begin by reviewing up-to-date lung cancer screening guidelines that actually changed recently, so very important uh, for general internal medicine. Then I want to discuss the standard of care workup and management strategies for patients with resectable lung cancer, and followed by outlining preclinical and clinical rationale for perioperative immunotherapy in resectable lung cancer, highlighting how immunotherapy can be brought in to optimize the treatment strategy for these patients. I then want to examine clinical trial data for both neoadjuvant, meaning immunotherapy given before surgery, and adjuvant immunotherapy, therapy given after surgery for patients with resectable lung cancer. Lastly, I will focus on reviewing immunotherapy toxicities and management, as well as a few special populations. So I think no talk by an oncologist would be uh, would be complete without this introductory slide uh, highlighting uh, cancer cases and cancer deaths. And lung cancer as of last year continues to be the number one cancer killer in the United States. It's the second most frequently diagnosed cancer. And again, is the most deadly cancer for both men and women, highlighting the importance of diagnosing this cancer earlier and optimizing effective strategies for cure. So, how do we do that? Well, we do have lung cancer screening and it is effective in reducing lung cancer specific mortality. The main trial that showed this benefit was a US trial called the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial that included over 50,000 patients aged 55 to 74 with at least a 30 pack year history of smoking who were active smokers or had quit within the past 15 years. Patients were randomized to annual screening with low dose CT for three years or screening with chest X-ray, which interestingly enough was actually not standard at the time. But regardless, uh, the CT screening identified a 20% relative reduction in lung cancer specific mortality and with a 6.7% reduction in all cause mortality. And the majority of cancers identified with CT screening were early stage, stage one and stage two, and the greatest difference in the rate of detection was in detection of stage one cancers. Also of importance, there were fewer stage four lung cancers diagnosed at the second and third annual CT screening, highlighting how CT screening was uh, efficacious in identifying earlier stage cancers and preventing them from progressing to metastatic cancers. More recently, earlier this year, the USPSTF updated their screening guidelines for low-dose CT uh, in patients now expanded to age 50 to 80 years who have a 20-pack year history of smoking, so decreased from 30, who are current smokers or have quit within the past 15 years. So the hope is that this will even further identify early stage lung cancers with the hope of then obviously uh, trying to ensure cure and long-term survival. So how do we work up and stage patients 
with potentially resectable lung cancer. There are many things that we need to do for patients who have a suspicious nodule on a CT scan. One is a PET CT let, to identify the FDG avidity, the suspicious nature of this nodule. It also helps to identify any areas of metastatic spread. Obviously, we also need to do a biopsy with bronchoscopy and pathologic mediastinal lymph nodes uh, evaluation to comprehensively stage our patients. PFTs are important to determine one's eligibility for surgical resection. And then a brain MRI is important because unfortunately, lung cancer has a tropism for brain and it's important to rule out metastatic spread to the CNS prior to pursuing surgery. Now, three of these middle things, biopsy, bronchoscopy, and pathologic mediastinal lymph node evaluation, oftentimes can all happen concurrently. And here at Georgetown, we are fortunate to have leading experts in interventional pulmonology who are utilizing the latest technology to help our patients. This is an example of uh, one of their toys, uh, the intuitive robotic-assisted bronchoscopy. And with this instrument, uh, they are able to get to smaller nodules in harder-to-get areas and diagnose cancers at an earlier stage hopefully helping to promote long-term survival. And this is a, a, a picture here of Dr. Krokmal, uh, one of our expert interventional pulmonologists, demoing this robot uh, on, on a model uh, of lung cancer. So staging, so why is lymph node staging important? Well, first, how do we stage lymph nodes? And, and so this is just a brief review. And uh, we characterize lymph nodes by N1, N2, or N3. N1 lymph nodes are perihylar, uh, hyalur lymph nodes, basically uh, nodes that are in the immediate vicinity of the lung cancer. Once lymph node involvement enters the mediastinum, uh, that is considered at least N2 lymph node involvement if on the same side as the cancer. And if on the opposite side, this is considered N3 lymph nodes. And then supraclavical lymph node involvement is considered N3 as well. Though I should mention that once lymph nodes get into the mid and high cervical chain, that is actually considered metastatic disease. So why is this important? Well, obviously accurate staging helps inform the management strategies that are best for our patients. And in general, patients who have no lymph nodes or N1 lymph nodes, by and large, if otherwise healthy, uh, we will pursue surgical resection and goal of cure for their cancer. Once we get into N2 lymph node, this starts to get a little murkier, and this is where multidisciplinary discussion is very important. Uh, there are several factors that might uh, influence the ability to do surgery. They include uh, the level of stations, multi-stations involved, uh, bulky lymph nodes, and these are all things that we discuss at our tumor board and interdisciplinary clinic. Uh, then once we get to N3, this is generally considered unresectable and requiring definitive chemoradiation. And then obviously metastatic disease is treated with palliative treatments such as chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and targeted therapy. So I unfortunately would argue that the current standard practice for the majority of patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer is not good enough. The long-term survival for patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer uh, at five years is 24 to 73% for patients with stage 1B to 3B non-small cell lung cancer. So what that means is once we have lymph node involvement, you're looking at around a 50% chance or less of a five-year survival in patients that are potentially curable. And while we give chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting for patients with stage two and three disease in an effort to eradicate micrometastatic disease and promote cure, the absolute benefit is relatively small at 5% at five years. And this is really independent of whether chemotherapy is given in the neoadjuvant or the adjuvant setting. So obviously we really need to optimize our strategy for these patients. And I think one very promising potential that will soon enter the clinic is bringing in immunotherapy into patients with resectable lung cancer. So to start off with that, I want to review briefly how immunotherapy works. And initially, how does the immune system itself respond to cancer? So cancer, like any other foreign uh, element in your body, uh, produces neoantigens. Uh, and these antigens are then recognized by antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, and then presented to your resting innate uh, immune system, uh, the resting T cells that are then activated, expand, and secrete cytokines, granzymes that directly target uh, their unique antigen, and in this case, tumor cells, and help to keep tumors under durable control. However, the immune system 
uh, does have breaks in it, which makes sense because it helps to prevent autoimmunity, but cancer can co opt these breaks. One example is the PD1 PDL1 interaction. PD1 is a transmembrane protein expressed on T cells, B cells, and NK cells. And when it binds with its ligand, PDL1, which is expressed on multiple tissues, but can be expressed in particular on more advanced cancers in lung cancer. Uh, this interaction leads to uh, peripheral T effector cell exhaustion and promotes conversion to a T regulatory immune inhibitory state. Another checkpoint that I will discuss in less detail is the CTLA-4 B7 checkpoint, which is present at a more of a priming earlier stage in immune activation. Uh, and, and this is something, again, that I will focus on less in this talk. But how do we target these checkpoints? Well, uh, we now have antibody blocking drugs to target these inhibitory checkpoints. And on the right, you see the mechanism for uh, PD-1 blockade, which happens more at the level of the effector immune response at the tissue. And by blocking this interaction, one can reestablish already pre-existing anti-tumor T cell immunity, uh, leading to reactivation of immune control of cancer and significant clinical efficacy. PD-1 blocking antibodies that we utilize in the clinic include pembrolizumab, nivolumab, semiplumab. PD-L1 blocking antibodies include atizolizumab and dervalumab. And then again, uh, CTLA-4 signal, this is one that happens more at the priming phase of the immune system. And the primary blocking antibody used here is ipilimumab. So why do I say that durable immunosurveillance exists in those treated with PD-1 blockade? Well, we now have extended data uh, for some of the earlier uh, phase three clinical trials of immunotherapy in patients with advanced metastatic lung cancer. And we've seen durable clinical benefit in these patients. On the left is data from the Keynote 024 trial. This was a phase three trial that randomized patients with high PDL1 expression on their tumors of 50% or more to treatment with immunotherapy monotherapy with pembrolizumab or chemotherapy. And as you can see here at five years, we're seeing a significant improvement in long-term survival at 32% survival at five years. And while the survival data is not quite as long for pembrolizumab with chemo or other immunotherapy agents with chemotherapy, we also see durable survival here. And these are results that were really unheard of prior to the immunotherapy era. And so if we can take that durable clinical benefit and move it to the perioperative setting, this really has potential to enhance cure rates in our patients. So first let's talk about adjuvant immunotherapy, that is immunotherapy after surgery. So up until about a month ago, this is the only slide I could have showed you on adjuvant immunotherapy, because while phase three trials, they've been accrued for some time, they take a long time to produce results. However, we were fortunate that just about a month ago, results of the Empower 010 study, the first results were reported and presented at the ASCO annual meeting. This is the design of this study. So this study was for patients with completely resected stage 1B to 3A non-small cell lung cancer who subsequently received histology-appropriate chemotherapy and were randomized to treatment with atezolizumab, which is a pdl one blocking antibody or best supportive care. The primary endpoint of this study was disease-free survival, and that, what that means is really a rate of disease recurrence or death as opposed to you know, our traditional gold standard for survival, just alive or dead. And so this was the primary endpoint that was tested in hierarchical fashion, uh, first in a pdl one positive stage 2 to 3A patients, followed by all randomized stage 2 to 3A patients, followed by the intention to treat population. This was a positive study, and so at a median follow-up of almost three years, 32.8 months, in the primary population of pdl one positive stage 2 to 3A patients, there was a durable disease-free survival benefit identified with a hazard ratio of 0.66. When looking at all randomized patients with stage two to three A disease, uh, this benefit also was apparent, though perhaps not as pronounced with a hazard ratio of 0.79. And the reason for this is it appears that the prime, when looking at subgroup analyses, the primary benefit was driven in patients that had a high expression of PDL1 on their tumors, whereas the benefit was more marginal in those with PDL1 a negative expression, though I caution against definitive conclusions here because the study was not powered for these particular analyses. 
And while overall survival data is still immature, you can see on the far left in the primary efficacy population of PDL1 expressing stage 2 to 3A cancers, uh, there is the beginning of a separation of these curves, but we're still awaiting data on an overall survival benefit. Safety is obviously important as well, and immunotherapy was associated with adverse events, with grade three to four adverse events of 22% with atezolizumab. Uh, serious adverse events were seen in 17.6% of patients, although this did not appear to translate into significant increase in mortality. However, again, around half of patients did experience immune-mediated adverse events, uh, which are a class of toxicity that I'll talk about a little bit later. However, as you see here, the majority of these immune-mediated adverse events were lower grade. Um, later grade adverse events occurred at a frequency of no more than 4% for any individual adverse event. So the majority were either asymptomatic or required oral steroids. Though it's important to consider because obviously these are patients for which the goal is cure and to induce significant morbidity or mortality would be very important in these patients. So what are some unanswered questions and potential controversies for adjuvant immunotherapy in resectable non-small cell lung cancer? First, will the statistically significant and clinically significant benefit in disease-free survival lead to accelerated FDA approval of adjuvant atezolizumab? The FDA has shown that they will accept disease-free survival endpoints uh, as rationale for approval. We actually fairly recently in the lung cancer community saw the approval of osimertinib, which is a targeted therapy targeting a driver mutation called EGFR in lung cancer. This is our primary therapy uh, for patients with advanced uh, metastatic EGFR mutant lung cancer, but it has recently been approved for patients in the adjuvant setting based off of disease-free survival data alone. But to go back to immunotherapy, will this, will this lead to a, uh, an approval in this space? Will approval be limited to those with stage 2 and 3A disease? Will it be limited to those with PDL1 positive disease? That remains to be seen. Importantly, will a disease-free survival benefit translate into an overall survival benefit? Based off the mechanism of immunotherapy and its ability to generate a robust, durable immune response, I think the answer to that will be yes, but we still await that data. And lastly, as is the case for metastatic lung cancer, will there be a role for combination of chemotherapy plus PD-1 immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting? And actually to answer this last question, we currently have a trial open here at Georgetown for which I am the site PI. This is a phase three adjuvant study in patients with resected non-small cell lung cancer, stage 1B to 3A, who are then randomized to either standard of care chemotherapy chemotherapy followed by immunotherapy, or the combination of chemoimmunotherapy followed by maintenance immunotherapy. One note on the study population, as I mentioned earlier, there is a large proportion of patients that actually have actionable driver mutations, that is mutations in the cancer itself that cause it to grow that we could target with pill therapies. Examples of those mutations are seen in this population where I see here on the left, EGFR, ALK, others include ROS1, BRAF, um, and these patients typically do not respond well to immunotherapy, and that's why they have been excluded in the more modern immunotherapy clinical trials. But what are some limitations for adjuvant therapy trials? So as I mentioned earlier, these trials take a long time to see results with a median of 11 years in adjuvant non-small cell lung cancer studies from time of first patient enrollment to publication of results. And in that amount of time, oftentimes when we get to results, it's for a treatment regi regimen that is already not standard of care and already uh, out of date. So it's important that we, uh, that we look at other trials and other ways to look at earlier efficacy uh, analyses. Uh, and then also the adjuvant trials lack a, a significant correlative science that can really help look for surrogate of long-term benefit, as well as um, adding additional information to the underlying mechanisms of the disease and treatment. So that's a good segue to neoadjuvant immunotherapy. And I would like to provide one caveat and one additional disclaimer of myself, disclosure, I should say, is that I am a firm believer in the neoadjuvant approach. I think this is the future of the treatment of our patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So what are potential advantages of this approach? For one, there tends to be greater compliance with neoadjuvant therapy compared to adjuvant therapy. 
There is also evidence to suggest a potential for improved immune activation with a neoadjuvant compared to an adjuvant approach. So preclinically, this has been seen in a murine breast cancer tumor model in which mice that received neoadjuvant PD-1 therapy had prolonged survival compared to mice who received adjuvant immunotherapy. Now, obviously humans are not mice, but there is early data to suggest that this approach may also hold true for, for human studies as well. This is data from the phase 1b OPASIN trial, uh, neoadjuvant and adjuvant immunotherapy trial in resectable palpable melanoma. And in this study, patients who received neoadjuvant immunotherapy with nivolumab and ipilimumab had a greater expansion of tumor infiltrating T cells in the peripheral blood compared to patients that received adjuvant immunotherapy. And that's shown here for T cells detected at baseline in dark colors, but also there was increased expansion of newly detected clones, suggesting that there's something very important about the intact tumor burden in eliciting a robust tumor specific immune response. In addition, pathologic endpoints serve as potential surrogates for clinical efficacy. And then again, extensive resection tissue allows for in-depth correlative analyses. So when I say surrogate for clinical efficacy, what do I mean? Well, if we could identify an early efficacy endpoint, an early surrogate for long-term benefit, this could lead to earlier approvals of therapies in the perioperative space and help to, to provide you know, these newer drugs to our patients sooner. Uh, Pathologic response is already utilized as a surrogate endpoint in breast cancer. And there is data that major pathologic response, which is defined by less than or equal to 10% tumor cells in a resection specimen. Uh, so major pathologic response with chemotherapy is associated with the survival benefit. This is seen in about 20% of patients treated with chemotherapy. And the association uh, appears to be stronger than that seen with imaging response. Now, what are some potential perceived and potential disadvantages to the neoadjuvant approach? One is clinical use. This approach is overall not used quite as frequently as adjuvant chemotherapy in current practice. Other proposed disadvantages include that the tumor might progress on therapy, preventing a potentially curative surgery. Toxicity might include a potentially curative surgery. And the therapeutic effects of the immunotherapy itself could make the surgeries more complicated or perhaps more dangerous. So what data do we have to confirm or refute these potential disadvantages as well as advantages? Well, there have been multiple early phase trials of the safety and feasibility of PD-1 immunotherapy with or without CTLA-4 immunotherapy in resectable non-small cell lung cancer. The largest of these studies is the LCMC3 study, and we saw more data pr uh, pr uh, presented on this study earlier this year at the World Conference of Lung Cancer. This is the design of the study. It is a single arm phase two study in which patients with resectable stage 1B to select 3B non small cell lung cancer received two cycles of atezolizumab, that's PDL1 immunotherapy, prior to surgery and then standard of care. The primary endpoint of the study was major pathologic response. And again, the study included 181 patients. So what were key results of this study? 88% of patients were able to proceed to surgery of whom 92% achieved an R0 resection and 43% had pathologic downstaging, suggesting that neoadjuvant immunotherapy did not impede surgical outcomes. Second, a major pathologic response rate was seen in 21% of patients, including a complete pathologic response rate, meaning no viable tumor uh, in resection specimens, seen in 7% of patients. And at a median follow-up of 2.1 years, while the median disease-free and overall survival have not been reached, we see encouraging signs of clinical efficacy when overlaid over historical data treated uh, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is just a summary slide for your reference of data from several studies that showed overall similar results. I would say one exception is this bottom study, the Ionesco study, which was a European study that actually was stopped early due to excessive 90-day post-op mortality. And so it will be interesting to see why that was seen in this particular trial. But overall, neoadjuvant studies showed the safety and feasibility of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. And this is in no ways a statistically appropriate, so any statisticians in the audience, please avert your eyes. But if you combine this data, you see a major pathologic response rate on the order of 21% with a pathologic complete response rate on the order of 7%. And when PD-1 immunotherapy is combined with CTLA-4 immunotherapy, 
we see perhaps a numerically greater uh, res pathologic response rates, although this uh, combination is not currently being explored in phase three neoadjuvant studies. So that's PD-1, pd one neoadjuvant monotherapy, but what about combination therapy with PD-1 and chemotherapy? There are several phase two studies that have reported results, and these have been very impressive thus far, with the majority of patients going on to receive surgical resection, and importantly, very impressive pathologic response endpoints. And again, when you combine this data, we see major pathologic response rates on the order of 58% with pathologic complete response rates on the order of 33%. Again, pathologic complete response means you remove the tumor and there is no viable tumor in the resection specimen. And what this suggests is that pathologic complete response rate itself is potentially a viable, statistically valuable surrogate endpoint. And so this is an endpoint that is now being looked at in several of the phase three neoadjuvant studies. And we actually have early data from one of these studies, the Checkmate 816 study that was presented at the AACR and ASCO conferences earlier this year. So this is the design of the Checkmate 816 study. Uh, this is a study of patients with potentially with, with resectable stage 1B to 3A non-small cell lung cancer. And this was stratified by disease stage, PDL1 status, and gender. And patients were randomized to receive either nivolumab with chemotherapy for three cycles or neoadjuvant therapy with chemotherapy for three cycles, followed by surgery and then optional adjuvant chemo with radiation. The primary endpoints of this study were pathologic complete response and event-free survival. First, looking at the baseline characteristics and surgical data. So baseline characteristics, you could see the populations were quite well balanced and that in terms of disease stage, two thirds of patients in both arms had stage three disease, which is the highest risk for recurrence uh, of you know, the patients that are typically deemed resectable, but otherwise characteristics quite well balanced between groups. So what about surgical endpoints? Well, when you look at all patients, you could see 94% of patients completed neoadjuvant therapy with nivolumab plus chemo compared to 85% with chemo. And overall, 83% of patients went on to receive surgery in the nevo plus chemo group compared to 75% with chemo alone. And the median duration of surgery was actually shorter in the nevo chemo group at 184 minutes compared to 217 minutes, which could potentially be a surrogate for the complexity of the surgery. When broken down further by stage, you could see this was primarily driven by the more locally advanced stage three patients in which 83% received surgery in the stage 3A group with nevo chemo compared to 72% with chemo alone. And this was largely driven by greater disease progression in patients treated with chemotherapy in this group. And again, the duration of surgery was shorter for the immuno chemo group at 186 minutes. Other key surgical outcomes included the fact that the median time from last dose of neoadjuvant therapy to surgery uh, was essentially equivalent between arms, uh, suggesting that neoadjuvant immunotherapy when combined with chemotherapy did not lead to any untold delay. In addition, in patients with stage 3A disease, there was a greater rate of conversion from a minimally invasive to open thoracotomy in patients with stage 3A disease uh, treated with chemotherapy alone. And there was also a greater rate of pneumonectomy, so complete lung removal in those treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And at the same time, hospital length of stay was similar, rates of surgery-related complications were similar, as were the rates of an R0 complete resection, suggesting that not only is neoadjuvant immunotherapy plus chemotherapy not worse uh, than chemotherapy alone, but may actually be better and capable uh, of creating safer surgeries and surgeries with less morbidity. Now, what about pathologic endpoints? As I mentioned, this was a primary endpoint of this study. And as you can see here in the primary efficacy endpoint population, the intention to treat, so all randomized patients, a pathologic complete response rate of 24% was seen in the immuno plus chemo group compared to 2.2% treated with chemotherapy alone. Now, when looking at subgroup analyses, this appeared to occur independent of disease stage or disease histology, as well as PDL1 status or tumor mutational burden or choice of platinum chemotherapy. When looking at major pathologic response rate, which, which, which was, as I mentioned, less than or equal to 10% viable tumor cells, we see an MPR rate of 36.9% in, 
in the group treated with nivolumab plus chemotherapy compared to only 8.9% in those treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. More important, we could see that the depth of pathologic response was more pronounced in those treated with immunotherapy plus chemotherapy, with median viable tumor percentage of 10% in those treated with nivolumab plus chemotherapy compared to 74% in those treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In addition, radiographic response rates, as you can see here, were higher in those treated with nivolumab plus chemotherapy. What about safety? Well, overall, safety was very similar and comparable in both arms. The rates of treatment-related adverse events were similar in both arms, as were the rates of treatment-related adverse events leading to discontinuation, as well as treatment-related serious adverse events. The breakdown here is, is what we would typically expect with chemotherapy, and as you can see here, was well-balanced between groups. And when looking specifically at immune-mediated side effects, uh, most of these tended to be lower grade and did not appear to occur at a significant increased rate, especially when compared to patients treated with immunotherapy in the metastatic or locally advanced disease setting. So what are some key takeaways from perioperative immunotherapy and resectable lung cancer? Well, as I mentioned earlier, for adjuvant immunotherapy with a positive disease-free survival advantage for adjuvant atezolizumab, I fully anticipate the approval of this therapy by the end of the year. The big question is, will this be limited to patients with stage 2 and 3A disease? Will it be limited to those with pdl one positive disease? This remains to be seen. In addition, with improved pathologic response and surgical outcomes with neoadjuvant nivolumab plus chemotherapy, will we see accelerated FDA approval before event-free and overall survival data emerges? I think this is highly unlikely, but it at least is thought-provoking given the very encouraging pathologic response data, as well as the lack of apparent harm on surgical outcomes. Third, if both neoadjuvant adjuvant trials are considered positive and actually leads to the approval, which strategy will be preferred? I think you know my answer. I am biased toward the neoadjuvant approach, but I think we could potentially see where those with a more locally advanced resectable cancer get neoadjuvant therapy, and perhaps those that go straight to surgery that then after surgery are found to have more advanced disease than previously thought, perhaps those will be the patients in whom adjuvant immunotherapy is pursued. And lastly, and I didn't have time to talk about this in detail today, but how can we implement broad molecular profiling in the perioperative setting? And what I mean by that is what I said earlier, there's a large proportion of patients with lung cancer who actually have mutations in the cancer that cause it to grow, that we target with pill therapies. The list of these mutations and approved therapies continues to grow, and these treatments are starting to trickle down to the perioperative setting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, osimertinib, our frontline for patients with EGFR mutation lung cancer, is now approved in adjuvant therapy for patients with resected EGFR positive lung cancer. So it's very important that we implement broad molecular profiling to interrogate for these mutations, not only in patients with advanced disease, but also for patients in the perioperative setting so we could determine the most appropriate therapy. And this has to be done rapid enough so as not to delay potentially curative treatment. So here at Georgetown, I also want to mention that we have several clinical trials in the perioperative setting. So two immunotherapy clinical trials we have, for which I am the site PI of both studies. The first study is the Skyscraper 05 study. This is a phase two trial looking at patients with resectable stage 2 to 3B disease, and it includes treatment with atezolizumab, which is a PDL1 immunotherapy, together with tirigolumab, which is uh, blocking another checkpoint called TIGIT, which has shown encouraging clinical efficacy in the metastatic setting. The second study I mentioned earlier is the Al Alchemist Chemo-IO adjuvant study that randomizes patients to standard of care, chemotherapy sequentially followed by immunotherapy, and then combination chemoimmunotherapy. We also have several targeted therapy clinical trials, and these are led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Chul Kim. And the first study is called the Nautica-1 study. This uh, incorporates a lot of different driver mutations, including ALK, ROS1, NTRAC, BRAF, and RET, with appropriate targeted therapy for these unique mutations. The second study is the NeoAdora study, and this is particularly for patients with EGFR mutations in which osimertinib is given in the perioperative setting. Again, this is our frontline standard for patients with metastatic EGFR-positive lung cancer. So we really have a clinical trial option for almost 
any patient with lo locally advanced resectable non-small cell lung cancer. And so it's important that these patients be referred to us early uh, in the course of diagnosis and workup so that we can determine if patients are candidates for potentially uh, paradigm altering clinical trials. So with the last third or so of my talk, I want to talk a bit about immunotherapy toxicities and special populations. Uh, focusing first on immunotherapy in patients with chronic viral infections. So among non-AIDS defining malignancies, lung cancer is actually the leading cause of death in people living with HIV. And a risk of lung cancer is increased in patients with chronic viral infections like hepatitis. Unfortunately, these patients have routinely been excluded from immunotherapy clinical trials despite advocacy efforts. The thought behind their exclusion being, well, if they have a process that affects their immune system, that that could in some way impede response uh, and efficacy assessment. And this is found to not be the case. Uh, early studies of anti-PD-1 immunotherapy have been found to be safe and effective in people living with HIV. In addition, there is actually a very intriguing aspect to this in that PD-1 has been shown to be upregulated uh, in, in, in association with virus-specific CDA-positive T cells. So it's, a, I should, let me clarify, upregulated on virus-specific CDA-positive T cells and associated with uh, T cell exhaustion in patients with HIV and hepatitis. And that blockade, PD-1 blockade, can potentially restore the function of these exhausted virus-specific T cells. So it's quite possible that our anti-cancer immunotherapy treatments might be beneficial in patients with chronic viral infections. And so to look at this further, one of my colleagues, Dr. Chul Kim, who's a world expert in this population, has designed a clinical trial of dervalumab, which is an anti-PD-1, uh, PD-L1 immunotherapy, uh, together with chemotherapy in patients with chronic viral infections, not only looking at the safety and efficacy from a cancer standpoint, but looking in collaboration with our basic science colleagues, Dr. Uh, Marta um, Colorabro, um, looking at how the immunochemotherapy uh, affects uh, the virus response. So this is an open and enrolling study that we have here at Georgetown. One also special population and something to watch out for is that anti-PD-1 immunotherapy does appear capable of reactivating latent tuberculosis. There have been multiple case reports and case series uh, that suggest that when this occurs, it tends to occur at a median of 6.3 months after immunotherapy initiation. And it does appear to be associated with PD-1 blockade independent from the use of steroids or other immune modulating mechanisms uh, and or uh, other immune modulating therapies. And the proposed mechanism for this is that PD-1 blockade can increase the TB-specific CD4 T cell response, resulting in an overproduction of interferon gamma and exaggerated immune inflammatory response. And as you see here in the figures on the right, uh, this clinical picture can oftentimes be difficult to discern from immune-mediated pneumonitis, other infections, or even disease progression. Uh, so it's going to be something to keep in mind when patients present with these sorts of findings. And it suggests that targeted screening for latent TB is actually important, in particular for patients at higher risk for reactivation, such as those with lung cancer treated with chemoimmunotherapy and combination immunotherapy strategies. So the onus is on us as oncologists to identify these patients and screen them for latent TB to see if certain patients are candidates for actual suppressive therapy. But the overwhelming main class of immune-related adverse events, or, or sorry, of toxicities with immunotherapy are so-called immune-related adverse events. And so when I discuss these with my patients, what I tell them is that while the goal of immunotherapy is to really uh, invigorate an anti-tumor immune response, sometimes the immune system can get a little overzealous and excited and go after normal areas of the body, the so-called pick your itis, uh, meaning inflammation can occur in almost any organ in the body. Uh, there are multiple proposed mechanisms for this, including uh, shared antigens between tumors and healthy tissue, as well as levels of pre-existing autoantibodies, increased levels of inflammatory cytokines, as well as potentially complement mediated inflammation. But as you see here, this is a meta-analysis of thousands of patients treated on immunotherapy clinical studies. And you could see that the timing and onset of these adverse events is quite heterogeneous with infusion reactions tending to occur earlier 
and other reactions, while at a median time to onset, maybe occurring around the three, two to three, four month mark, but it can occur months after immunotherapy initiation or even years. And so this is important because it's very different than the toxicities we see with chemotherapy, which tend to be cumulative. Uh, similarly, with uh, resolution, this is also heterogeneous and oftentimes depends on whether the adverse event is of a lower grade and more mild or more severe and requiring immune modulating therapies such as steroids, uh, which is shown here, the median time to resolution for those is shown on the bottom half of this figure. Shown in a different way, this curves illustrate, this is from the same study, these curves illustrate where the beginning of the curve represents the median time of onset of a specific adverse event, and the end of the curve represents median time of resolution. And you can see that there is quite heterogeneity amongst the different adverse events. And so uh, management strategies must really be tailored uh, toward patients specifically to, to target these adverse events. And it's also important that the workup and management of immune-related adverse events uh, takes on multidisciplinary input. Workup is organ-dependent and uh, requires assessment of other common etiologies. And as I mentioned earlier, these adverse events can occur days to years after immunotherapy initiation. So as immunotherapy is moved into the perioperative setting, the first person to see a potential adverse event could potentially be someone in the emergency room or a primary care doctor or even another subspecialist. And fatal toxicities can occur. Uh, this is less common, but when they do occur, at least with PD-1 monotherapy, what's most common is pneumonitis, hepatitis, or neurotoxicity. And with combination immunotherapy, what we see most common in terms of fatal adverse events are colitis or myocarditis. And while the initial management strategy of these adverse events tends to be similar regardless of the organ involved, that is high dose steroids, if the adverse event does not improve and become steroid refractory, then oftentimes we wade into more uncharted waters where the uh, subsequent therapies are more uh, adverse event and organ specific and really requires coordination with experts uh, in the respective fields, such as GI doctors for colitis, pulmonologists for pneumonitis, uh, endocrinologists, cardiologists, et cetera. And then ultimately the decision to resume immunotherapy must be made on a case by case basis. Determined factors include immune related adverse event severity, disease status, overall prognosis, um, as well as patient provider preference. These are all important in deciding whether patients, whether it is safe to resume immunotherapy after the occurrence of an immune related adverse event. However, there is a silver lining here in that there is data that suggests that patients who experience an immune-related adverse event may have improved clinical benefit with immunotherapy compared to those who do not. This is pooled data from multiple atezolizumab uh, immunotherapy chemotherapy trials in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And as you can see here, there was improved response for patients who developed immune-related adverse events, improved response to immunotherapy compared to those who did not. And it appears that this was also associated with a survival benefit. And what's interesting here is that the survival benefit appeared to occur also in the control arm in patients who didn't receive immunotherapy. And so this suggests that perhaps the generation of an immune active uh, response, whether that's done with immunotherapy or chemotherapy, is perhaps almost prognostic of the disease course and how patients will do overall. So with that, I'd just like to conclude with some remarks. Uh, number one, lung cancer screening is effective in reducing lung cancer-specific mortality and identifies earlier stage lung cancers. And hopefully now with the expansion of this to include more patients, uh, we will hopefully be able to identify even more earlier stage lung cancers. Perioperative immunotherapy is safe and feasible. And furthermore, adjuvant immunotherapy with atezolizumab appears to enhance disease-free survival, in particular in patients with PDL1 positive stage 2 to 3A resected non-small cell lung cancer. And again, I fully anticipate that this will be FDA approved. Neoadjuvant therapy with nivolumab plus chemotherapy is safe and demonstrates imp impressive pathologic endpoints. And while that might not yet lead to approval, I think that is also around the corner. And lastly, immunotherapy-related side effects 
are heterogeneous and require multidisciplinary input for prompt diagnosis and effective management. And this will become more prominent as immunotherapy is used more and more in patients with now resectable lung cancer. And this is also the case for other malignancies as well. And when we have patients that have resected uh, cancer, oftentimes we are evaluating them less frequently. So it's possible that the first person to identify these again might be a primary care physician or an ER physician or some other subspecialty. So important to have at least a rudimentary knowledge of these side effects and promptly integrate uh, the oncologist in the workup and management of this. So with that, I just wanna thank you for your attention. Um, I have been really humbled. So this picture, you know, not, not a lot unique about this. This is the front of our hospital, but I took this picture on my first day, uh, now approaching a year ago. Uh, and I am just humbled by how much I've been learning from my patients, my families, and my outstanding colleagues, both within uh, the Department and Division of Oncology, uh, as well as outside in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and so with that, I, I want to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to field uh, any questions. Thank you.